So people having lunch, I think, but it's fine. The show must go on. So let's get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back again. Um, and we kept the, the better sessions for the after lunch session so people can feel happy about it. So we've discussed in the morning a lot of technology part, the machines, learning, data side of it. Now, it's very important. And I think uh, a very eye-opening presentation was uh, uh, about, the, about the evidence piece uh, that came out at the end of the last session. And I think that's where we're trying to get to this with this session to try to understand from the the country perspectives, from the the need perspective, what is it that needs to be applied. Otherwise, we've often seen this in, in different uh, domains where you have a tech world doing their own things, creating solutions, and then wondering why is no one using it? It's an amazing thing, right? And then the countries and and the leaders uh, who work with these countries are often think, why is we're seeing there's so much happening? Why is it not working for us? It's, this merging has to happen, and I think that's what this next session is going to look at. Uh, probably we have a great uh, panel uh, again that we'll speak about, and, and hats off to everyone who's involved in, in setting up these panels. We've got some great speakers come up. So first we have uh, Mr. Kerr from, from the FDA, um, who is the Deputy Director at the FDA. I won't say the specifics about it, uh, that you can read about it. But I think it's important to understand from, I mean, in fact, uh, I was just talking to Archana, and she said, how come there's no regulators and there's no the talkies about it? And I said, well, okay, you just wished for it and you got it. Uh, and so, can we talk about the need uh, from the from the need perspective? Uh, and then we'll have the others because it's great. So, over to Kevin. Thank you much. Thank you very much, and thanks to ITU and WHO for this, this invitation and for the University of Columbia for hosting us. Um, when I started with you this morning, I felt like I want to change the slides almost 200 times so far. So apologies. There are some redundancies. I'm going to go over them pretty quickly. But I'm going to try to leave time for questions because I really feel this is what we need to discuss. So uh, very briefly, this is you've seen this. Like We're really in a wonderful time right now where we have both you know, the powerful capabilities, computing capabilities, and the data sources available for us. So we have this opportunity to utilize AI to advance health in general. Uh, this is just to quickly to show you that uh, this is data from 2015, that a medium-sized hospital produced 665 terabyte of data. This is the, the data that we have and we can work with. Now, health data is available, but we have challenges with structure, organization, verifications, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all worth really getting deeper on. We cannot do it today, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions on that. So, also, as all of you follow, the, the digital health explosion is happening. We've heard uh, recently, for example, about the technical trial of Apple Watch for atrial fibrillation. They recruited 400,000 people. So, uh, for those of you who know how hard to recruit for clinical trials, this is amazing. So, we're really entering this new era. And also, if you think about it, when uh, we started this century in 2001, when it started 10 years ago, like 2001, 10, 20 years ago, the price of sequencing for human genome was so high, was in the thousands. And look where we are now. The price of an iPhone X can get you a human genome sequence. So really, an amazing time to be living in. So before I go, I want to highlight that there is really a, a, a rule for all of us who care for public health, is that no good data should go to waste. But it's a matter for all of us to come together and try to understand how to make that happen. And I think AI and all of you have changed. Having all of you here is really critical. Okay, I'll do that. So, why do we care as FDA? And we deeply care. First of all, the AI has potential for all aspects of the drug development, all the way from early target identifications to discovery to preclinical testing, toxicity, and into clinical testing on post market. You know, we've heard, to, we've heard today about a lot of innovation that might be really huge and make changes to the whole healthcare system. I, I want to challenge you to also look at the low hanging fruits. We have already challenges with clinical trials that we already have right now in the system. We cannot recruit well. We have a dropout. Can AI help on those as well? Maybe this is something very easy for us to jump in as a first step. And just this is just a few uh, papers that actually I want to reference. One of them, uh, interestingly, from Dr. Razavi, and who presented previously. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that data. But there are a lot of interesting aspects for AI within the whole de de drug development spectrum. Also, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but we have a lot of initiatives within the FDA, chief among them right now, trying to utilize real-world evidence. 
And AI, I think, it, it can play a really important role in this. And also, it has the capability for facilitating and refining clinical trials, which for me is I worked in clinical trials before, and I can tell you, we need all the help we can here. So uh, another challenge is, is that there is an increased need for relevant expertise. I'm going to explore this a little bit more. And I'm not saying here just purely data scientists or mathematicians. You know, I, I think there is a need for more of an amalgamation of expertise to address public health issues that bring all these groups together. And I'm going to address that a little bit further. Also understanding the high versus the reality. I think there's a lot of interesting things that happening with understanding where they are in the development cycle is going to be critical. For us as you know, reviewers and regulators, we really need to understand what's coming to us, what's realistic and what's not, and be ready for it. So, and then that, of course, all of us here, hopefully to work on some of this at least, the importance of establishing standard and shared understanding among all of us as stakeholders. So uh, it's been discussed today before, but like the promise for AI in breast cancer, for example, in the most relevant providers, this is all like pretty advanced initiatives here. And also Dr. Like Rosalian paper, which I think very modestly she discussed briefly, but I think it's really fascinating paper if you think about it. We have a system that looks at the pathology picture and predicts a genotype out of the phenotype. This is fascinating. Just one look at the picture and does that for you. So I think the potential is there. And this is just to show that like, it, it really touches in all the spectrum of drug development in general. So, you know, all this is happening and we heard about it, but what have we done? Just two months ago, FDA approved the first AI system actually for the epidemic. This is happening, you know. It's happening more and more. Last week we heard about another AI system that was also approved by FDA that looked at CT imaging and identified potential for brain hemorrhage, for example. So this is happening. So, and then, AI can be helpful in exploring the use of real-world data. A lot of, you know, just to kind of make uh, this very complicated, the real-world data is anything we, that's produced outside of the control setting of a clinical trial. And this is the definition we're using right now. And in general, they include all of those. They include EHR, you heard about that quite a bit, claims, uh, mobile health, wearables, registries, pharmacy records, PROs, patient reported outcomes. So all of this are really the pool of data that we have that we can utilize. As you can imagine, and I think Thomas uh, earlier today asked the questions why we're not digging into this data. And if this data has their own challenges, and I'm more than happy to discuss that. I'm just going to mention, mention one of them. When you do a, a randomized clinical trial, you randomize. Randomization really allows you to distribute all your variables, known and unknown. So biases are really distributed. When it comes to this data, we're not randomizing necessarily. So we really don't know this data as well as you would know the data produced in a clinical trial setting. So that's just one of the challenges. So uh, I know there's uh, we exchange a lot of uh, scientific papers, you know, between us as colleagues. But also this paper actually it's, it's not a paper; it's, it's an article that came up in the New York Times, and it's about AI system looking into developing your custom Halloween customs, you know, using and it's a fascinating paper, and I would highly encourage you to read it. It shows the promise, but it also shows the pitfalls and where we have to be careful. They gave an example of a 2013 MIT uh, AI system that was tasked with sorting a list of numbers with minimizing error. What it did is deleting the whole list because that's the way to reduce error. The most, you know, so they just, I know this is just all that high level, but this is a lot of the stuff we have to be really thinking about. So, and you have to know that prediction algorithm predicts the most likely decision or answer that might be achieved using the input data, not necessarily the accurate answer. And AI predictions and solutions could reflect flaws in the algorithm and databases that provide an unpredictable solution. So I'm happy to discuss this further later. But what's, what do we need right now? We need an understanding of the functions and tasks that lend themselves to adoption, AI adoption at this point. You know, more of a time frame. What do we have right now? What's ready to be adopted? And what's coming next and what's coming next? What's, what's not possible now, but possible maybe 10 years from now? And I think a shared understanding of that is critical. Then, Shared understanding of the principles and approaches that are essential to designing and adopting AI system. A lot of the talks today really touched on that a little bit and understanding what, what's the value of AI, how to evaluate AI, etc. So, uh, and the need, the need for quality continuum in the design of AI system. We have to remember that AI is just a component of a development system. And we have to think of quality as a continuum. So the whole process has to have quality integrated in it. To, for AI to function the best and for the outcome to be relevant to all of us, including us regulators. 
So and then the need for to understand that AI is not necessarily the silver bullet for everything. We've discussed that today, and we, I, I really think it's not man versus machine. It's going to be man versus man plus machine. And I think that's the key thing that was advanced earlier today by Dr. Magnitsky, I believe. And you've heard about the biases, so I'm not going to repeat those. So, and then we need a convergence of multidisciplinary expertise to address the evolution of AI. Computer science alone will not produce breakthrough system when it comes to public health. We need educational and training programs that connect essential disciplines and provide trainees with the needed skills. And I'm not talking here about physicians getting just the informatics training, but also I'm talking about when you have a data scientist and informatics experts working in the public health area, they really have to have a little bit in-depth understanding of what public health, what the area they're working in. So I think that's mutual understanding from both sides is needed. If you don't have that expertise, bring a team together that can address and see things from different perspectives. And then pilots, we need pilots to explore the utility of the AI system. I was very happy to hear about the fundings of the projects this morning. And I think this is just another step in us helping us all understanding what's coming our way. I think AI really requires us to, a little bit, to do a little bit of a mind shift. For example, failures when it comes to clinical trials or when with any of our evidence generation processes, it's clear. You fail, you know, you restart the process again. With AI, failure is an integrated part of the success. You know, you, you fail, you learn, and you improve, you know. So that's that's a lot of, you know, it might seem simple, but also it's an adaption in our thinking. And then I cannot highlight this enough. I think transparency is a key. And I, I, I want to highlight that actually as much as I can, because I think trans, as we move forward, transparency is the critical aspect. I think for us as reviewers and regulators, we really have to see how the data is generated, how the algorithm is designed. What, what's our the learning data sets? What are the potential pitfalls? We have to have an understanding of the process in general. And I think, I think all, the all the stakeholders come together and to be transparent in this area is going to be critical. So finally, I will leave you with a couple of points, a couple of people food for thought. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving area and we must, we must work together. And at, at the, the FDA, the FDA is eager to work with all stakeholders to facilitate innovation in this area. And we're really happy to be here with you. And again, thank you for inviting us. And I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Care, for this talking and very interesting uh, presentation and numbers. Um, I think we have some time for any burning questions of this. Is this vision hold out at the end? Okay. Yeah, so no questions. Okay, no questions on this stage. Anyone has any questions? Any comments before we go to speaker? We'll of course come back at the end of the session uh, for general questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, so let's move on to the next presentation uh, after having set the stage um, uh, for, for the thing. Um, Meho, um, is Meho at the noise? Uh, yeah. No, Meho third. I third, think. Oh, sorry. So it's Ashan um, who begins the presentation. Um, and and Ashan will discuss about the uh, you know, opportunities and challenges of AI in the actual implementation space of, of different areas of work uh, from the regular perspective. So, Shana, what do you Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity today to present uh, this very exciting topic uh, today. Uh, and following your discussion, it's going to be very difficult. I'm an ex FDA as well, at one point. Um, so, anyhow, today I'm going to talk about AI and drug development or development in general, the opportunities and challenges. Certainly, there are opportunities, but there are many challenges, as previous speakers have alluded to. Uh, oops. Okay, so um, looking at the current uh, clinical development or drug development model as a whole, there's um, a multitude of challenges. The time it takes to get a drug from the test tube into the patient or the clinic, um, according to the top center for the study of drug development, is 10 years or more. So that's an extended period of time, a lot of time, resources, personnel, everything else involved. And the failure rate, as you all know, for products is very high especially in early phases. 80% or more of potential drug candidates fail in the early phases, leading to large failure rates. And this is very expensive for companies involved in this process. They lose a lot of time, money, and it's also an impact to patients and public health if patients aren't getting good treatments in a timely manner. And um, it's estimated that actually in phase three, 
one-third um, failure rate for phase three. And that's far along in the drug development prior to filing of the marketing authorization or NDAs, MAAs, BLAs, and that's a very expensive endeavor, basically. And so the costs, again, the costs are extremely high, and they're just going up. So again, the Center for Study of Drug Development estimates that to bring a drug or a product, clinical product to market, it takes anywhere up to $2.55 billion. So again, a huge amount of cost. Okay, so, um, and this is straight from FDA. So I feel like I shouldn't even talk to this slide because we have an FDA expert here. Um, so FDA has classified clinical development essentially into five stages. Um, the first being discovery and development. So the screening of target compounds and looking at potential compounds for what activity it has in specific therapeutic areas or indications. And then, um, then we move into the animal testing phase or preclinical research um, for safety and toxicity profiles, essentially. Um, and then the product will move into the clinical research, which entails phase one, which is a smaller group of patients, phase two, including phase 2A, 2B studies, and phase three studies. And then we have FDA review which is the review and approval of the marketing application. And then once that product is approved, then it has uh, to undergo post-market surveillance whereby the agency is going to do a continual assessment of safety, looking at AEs, looking at potential signals, also monitoring what are called post-marketing commitments, which are pretty typical with approval letters um, generally you will have some sort of post-marketing commitment, whether it's a registry or continuing to follow up on patients in terms of safety profiles, et cetera. Okay. So AI to advance drug discovery. Um, so just to give you some examples of areas where AI could be useful, and again, it's still early phase, as all the speakers have alluded to, and there's still quite a lot of challenges to overcome, but there have been initial forays into this already. So the first area is to use AI to find insights into a disease. And machine learning and deep learning can potentially provide insights and patterns in data pools that can be used to generate hypotheses about how a particular um, disease state is being being generated, for example. And examples of this are IBM Watson, which was used by Pfizer in immuno-oncology research. And uh, I believe the other speakers alluded to immuno-oncology research. And that's a pretty hot area right now in overall clinical development. That's a pretty big buzzword, you could say. I think almost every company is trying to get into immuno-oncology if they're not in it already. but. Um, that's an area where AI could have some potential for positive impact. Um, another example is benevolent AI. They're using this tool to aid in determining how compounds target certain therapeutic areas. And then um, as far as discovery and development phase, AI as a tool is not new. Um, it's actually been in existence since the 1980s, if you will, using Excel, for example. You basically have like a dump of all this large data, and then you can use that data to translate that into some other understandings or generate information. So you could say that AI has been around in various formats. It's just evolved and grown, and it's become more sophisticated. And so um, it's a tool to analyze specific data or large-scale data information to aid in the discovery and development process by finding specific targets for specific de diseases and therapeutic areas. And I know previous um, speakers have, for example, uh, mentioned diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's been some work done in those areas as far as identification. 
Um, AI, again, may be more effective in certain areas, such as immuno-oncology or autoimmune diseases, such as arthritis, for example, um, or going back to um, the previous uh, talk about gene therapy um, at the gene. There's a lot of implications for gene therapy that it could identify the genetic cause of the disease state. So, um, again, areas for consideration. Um, and then for the screening and assessment stage, um, we can use AI to screen a potential new compound against similar available targets for activity. Typically, in drug development, you have a molecular screening library, or you do have large-scale tools, which you have to sift through thousands and thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of compounds to identify one single compound that gives you activity. And then you're going to move that into an animal model to test that further, whereas with AI, it could be a potential tool to cut down on the amount of time it takes to identify that target. So that, that could be a potential useful indication. Um, again, to screen compounds in cells or animal models to predict activity. Again, this goes back to potential in gene therapy. There are quite a number of uh, companies in the gene therapy space that are using AI, for example. Um, ex uh, some examples are, am I saying this right? Accentia AI platform, they uh, screen compounds in cells or animal models to essentially identify targets for activity. Adam-wise, uh, they're using it to ident identify potential drug candidates. Another use of AI is repurposing existing drugs. So in, in drug development or clinical development as a whole, one of the big challenges is once a drug is approved, how do we keep its advantage? How do we keep it on the market? How do we keep the market share? And how do we keep um, patients engaged and the providers engaged. So, you know, you have follow-on indications or you have new uses or you have new routes of administration, for example. Uh, but all that requires some form of uh, testing, obviously. Uh, so, but with AI, we could use it to find new uses for already approved drugs. So that same drug, using the AI tools, you could find out that, okay, it works in XYZ indication, but it's also showing activity in this, so that could um, shorten the amount of time to get it into the clinic and into the patient, potentially. So that's, that's a real advantage, I think. And um, it's already been studied or proven um, in drug safety toxicity uh, profiles, so it's less of a risk of a failure when you have an approved drug you know what it's going to do in the patient, you know what kind of safety profile you're going to have with it. Um, again, some examples, IBM Watson, Teva, they're using real-world data and mathematical algorithms to calculate this type of information. Uh, new Medi and Estella's Pharma, they've used it to identify new drug candidates using machine learning. Um, and then another area that's, that's very big, and it, it kind of falls into that whole gene therapy space, personalized or precision medicine. So looking at it from a single patient perspective versus a population level. So the analysis of individual health data, and there was a really excellent presentation earlier about EHR, electronic health records, and the previous speaker referred to real world evidence with real world data. So this all goes, this all ties in nicely basically. So you can, pull those individual health data and analyze it, and you can do a predictive analysis, essentially, to identify effective treatment on a patient-specific basis and in an area that's really big for like oncology, for example. Looking at um, customized approaches to treatment based on the patient. Um, and the application is easier than with large-scale data um, less chance of machine error. So the more data you have, the more data points you have, I mean, you, there's more chance of error that, you know, the data could be misinterpreted, there could be bias that uh, other speakers have already referred to, 
Or it could be that there are multiple ways of analyzing the same data sets. One person may do it this way, another group may do it this way. You may have a similar protocol, but they could all have variations. So that's all going to lead to some error or bias in the process. Um, examples of this MIT machine learning group, they're using uh, this uh, to get a deeper understanding of disease process and to design drugs, potentially. OK, so what are some of the challenges? And I think uh, other speakers have already done a good job with this, and I've alluded to some of them. But clinical trials uh, fail for a variety of reasons, including failure to recruit enough participants, mid-trial mid patient dropout, unintended and severe side effects and poor data collection methods. Um, naturally, trials that fail in a later phase prove more costly for both the company conducting the trial and potentially the patients who could benefit from the medicine. AI is a tool to aid in clinical development specifically. So how can we use AI in the clinical trial process? An example of that is matching the right trial with the right patient. So if we know exactly what we're looking at in terms of treatment and what patient can benefit from it, if this information can be matched up together, then that would significantly aid in the process. And as I said before, 80% of clinical trials fail to meet the enrollment timeline. So that, that's another big challenge. So how can we uh, use AI potentially to cut down on these issues of clinical trial <coughs> failures and uh, not being able to keep the patients essentially in the trials. Um, so no, that's, that's maybe AI has that, you know. some part to play in this. Uh, it has yet to play out completely in the real world, per se. But, uh, and as I alluded to before, one third of phase three early terminations are due to enrollment challenges. So when you can match the right trial with the right patient, you could potentially cut down on this challenge of enrollment and getting the wrong patients maybe in the wrong trial. Um, again, the EHR or electronic health records and using AI as a tool to analyze this data to match patients with trials. So just an example there. Um, some challenges with this, and this has been discussed in some detail earlier this morning. There are, of course, issues around data confidentiality and patient privacy with electronic health records and AI. It's far from perfect. Um, there's a lot of flaws, especially when it comes to patient privacy and protection, um, especially with the uh, GDPR. Um, that's, that's a huge concern in, in Europe and in other countries, and the data protection of, of the patients and the privacy of the information, and how is that information being stored, who has access to it, I mean, what, what types of parameters are you, are you capturing? These are all areas that, that are of concern, and I don't know that these have been resolved. Um, and HIPAA and protection of patient data from a U.S. perspective, healthcare perspective. Um, AI may not process information in different hospital settings, for example, in the same way, because there may not be standardization of data formats. So each hospital may have their own process. They may have the same system, or they may not. I don't know. They may have different systems, but there may be variability in even using the same system, because if the operator interprets it differently, then you can have a different outcome, basically. So in conclusion, AI is potentially a tool for advancing discovery and development. However, there are myriad of challenges that need to be overcome before it can be implemented across the board. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention today. Thank you very much. You, um, yeah, you can say. Thank you so much for succinctly uh, sort of uh, listing out the opportunities as well as the challenges. And not to scare anyone out there, but I think I think this is one of the part where we saw in the submissions in the morning that it's uh, very specific to, to individualized solutions, but uh, with care and I'm trying to line out 
the opportunities which are there in therapeutic uh, uh, diagnostic creation as well as uh, in the drug development uh, areas. And now we look at the systems area. And Nehu will talk about the systems need for uh, AI and systems space because that's what came out this morning and has been a big challenge as well. So Nehu, uh, who's a senior fellow at the Harvard Global Institute, and wears different hats. So I'm not going to speak about that. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me um, and really organizing this because, you know, listening to this from this morning, um, it's fascinating to see that how much work is being done in so many different areas. And I, the analogy I give is like the elephant. Uh, everybody's touching different parts of it and you don't know how the elephant comes together or does it come together and what piece this becomes. So I'm going to give you uh, a lens that's hopefully a little bit different. And that's a lens where a lot of global health in the world rests in the low and middle income countries. And there are entrenched problems there, and uh, those problems need to be solved. And governments are moving to say, wow, this is the best solution. And uh, policy papers are coming out. And I really want to give you a ground reality. I spent 23 years of my life uh, doing systems development in more than 30 countries. And I can tell you that there is a big gap between what we talk and how we implement. And I hope I can give you some sense in the short period of time. I'm going to divide it into three parts. The first part is really talking about what the global health challenges are at a very macro level, because it's impossible to do that justice in the time view. Then actually talk about some use cases, and then talk about how we've thought about training it at the Harvard Global Health Institute, because that's one of the programs that's part of the Institute. So very briefly, um, The Harvard Global Health Institute was started by the president of Harvard to convene across Harvard because he found groups were not talking to each other. Surprise. Uh, and that he wanted to address big global health problems. And actually, to be fair, Drew Faust did it. So it's before Larry Bacow came in. And so one of the initiatives is to say technology and health, and he said it's too big, emerging markets, low and middle income countries. So that's the framework that I'm going to work off. But I think there are lessons to be applied elsewhere. So let's look at the challenges. And you know this, but I'm just going to, this is WHO data, it's not my data. It's massive. You don't have enough hospital beds, right? So we can talk of AI, but you don't have enough hospital beds at all. <laughs> you don't have enough nurses. You can talk of AI, you don't have enough nurses. And if you look at this, it's a great slide, looking at global burden of disease with a global physician. Just look at the undersupply in so many parts of the world. So you come to one basic question. The best technology is only good as the best technology. How is it going to be delivered? Who's going to deliver it? And even for the few people who have to deliver it, do they have the knowledge and skills to deliver it? So I think it's my, what I'm trying to do is ask everybody to step back. That, you know, what happens day to day when people die of tuberculosis? What happens? when you have maternal and fetal mortality, that's the, the curve is not bending. You know, my space, diabetic eye disease, I see proliferative retinopathy. That's so bad, I don't have enough bandwidth to treat. Okay. So let's look at the, sorry, the other data set. This is key. At the end of the day, where does a rubber meet the road in healthcare? Quality of care. Right? At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. All technologies, all solutions, all drugs, if they don't enhance the quality of care, and if quality becomes worse, they don't work. And here is the problem. You have over no. close to 8 million deaths because of quality issues. So this is low and middle income countries. This is our global health results. And you have over a trillion dollars in lost productivity. But what's even worse is one in five patients who went to hospitals were harmed. I'll give you another really interesting publication that the Global Health Institute did, which is creating a lot of interesting discussion, is that they look at they looked at JCO accredited hospitals in the US and looked at outcomes and found whether your JCO accredited or state accredited made no difference. So I think we are talking about some foundational issues here. What are we so what is it that we are addressing? What is the problem? Um, falsified medicines. Sub-Saharan Africa, huge problem, okay? And these, what I'm trying to tell you is these are foundational issues we're dealing with. And if we don't address the foundations, then only, if we address it, then we can get beyond this. If we don't, then I think you will get to that first. 
the question is, what is the link between what we're discussing today and these issues? That's what I'm going to push at. But this is not simply an emerging market or a low and middle income problem. This is U.S. data. Why should this number be 250,000, 51,000? It should be zero. What you're basically telling me as a physician, I do the first, I, I sort of abrogate the Hippocratic Oath first by saying I do more harm by treating than I do good, right? Now this number has not moved a lot. This is medical error related deaths in hospitals in the US or in outpatient care. So this sets the stage. I can go into a lot more data. There's a lot more detail to show you how serious the problem is globally. All right. So then the question is, what we are all asking is, what is the promise of AI? This is a framework. That's not my framework. This is published by the government of India with the help of Accenture. And this is how the government of India is going to invest its money in AI and how it wants to frame the AI space in terms of practical application. So I think this framework works. You go from what you, you know, sensory to comprehension to intelligence to really implementation, which I'm glad they're doing, and then they want to really look at the impact. I've tried to put down what I believe are the areas of impact. Now we've talked a lot about this, you know, prevention, screening, very little has been talked about quality and how it's actually going to enhance quality. I want to talk a lot about skill shifting because in the absence of that, you're not going to solve the problem, even in the US. The cost of care is not sustainable. But this is a big piece. Sorry, this should be skill augmentation. How do you upskill? How do you educate? And is AI a role, has a role in professional education? We haven't talked about that at all, right? So healthcare is only as good as people who deliver them. The way we train is still legacy based. It takes how many years to produce a doctor? How many years to produce a nurse? Are there different ways to really get that skill up? Is there different ways to upskill? Because if you're not going to solve that, you're not going to solve the human resource problem, then you're not going to solve the healthcare problem. So I think, and I apologize for this. Um, and then, of course, we've talked a lot about this. I'm, I'm no expert here, but garbage in, garbage out. That's sort of the adage. And these problems are even worse in the low and middle income countries. There is no data. The data sources are not valid. Data bias is a huge issue. You build these systems here, you apply them to other populations. And I'll talk about that. Ethics, equity, is it OK? Are you sure it's validated? There's a tremendously great presentation from the Lancet on equivocation with outcomes. So this is what's happening. It's not me. It's government is going to roll this out. And by the way, three governments have released AI policies for healthcare. One is China, one is India, one is Russia that I know of. Right? And they're all going to go down this path. So the train is gone. So let me tell you two cases. I'm biased because I'm, it's from India, so I can, you know, bias is obvious. So forgive me for that, but uh, I should have taken a case from Sub-Saharan Africa. These are just, this, I just had the data. So, you know, cervical cancer is a huge problem. Um, India's numbers are just pathetic. Um, in fact, it outstrips maternal mortality by 2x. Okay. And uh, we have 1.4 million no, known undiagnosed cases because data is hard to get. Again, it's an estimate. Why? Not enough cytopathologists. So get, go, we don't have enough people to read. Forget reading, go one step earlier. Acquisition is poor. Staining is wrong. So in comes this young company and says, let's actually start with doing predictive analysis. So a cytopathologist who typically, let's say, reads 5,000 slides in a year can reach 50,000 slides a year. So now you just change the denominator of what you want in terms of trained professionals, right? But he found that all this was wrong. So the solution had to go backwards to say, you know, I can't do this if I don't digitize the slides. And I can't digitize if I don't stain them correctly. This is, I'm talking about foundational stuff. And so he's gone to develop this whole solution. We have no connection with him. I just find him a fascinating case. Okay, did you do this? Did it make any difference? Of course it made a difference. This produced more consistent results, I, th I think this is a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a, uh, a complex neural net, uh, or it's, it's some form of a complex neural net. And, uh, but well, here's the problem he found. Once he has these patients, there's not enough places to treat them. I, I think I raised that question before. 
the cost of treatment they can't afford. Guess where all these patients are in one of the cities? They are in the second, third tier cities. They are the urban poor also. By the way, there's a huge urban poor. Then the rural population. There's not enough places to treat them. And by the way, cytopathologists don't want this. They really don't want it. Because guess what? When I could employ so many more cytopathologists, now I'm saying one can scale by factor of 10. Right? The real bottleneck is verification. It doesn't have enough cytopathologists to verify the volume this is producing. So did you solve the problem? This is my question. On a, on a system level, you didn't. In fact, there are many parts of the system now are saying, how do we deal? It becomes an ethical issue. What's the moral dilemma here? You know and you can't do anything. So they say ignorance is this. Maybe there is an adage that lies here. But this is the problem, right? Let me tell you another one case which I think you alluded to, Elvi Prasada Institute, ophthalmologists, I know them well, do phenomenal work. <laughs> Numbers are staggering, right? In what, over 10 years, uh, no, 20 years, they have seen over 26 million patients. They see around 2 million patients a year. 50% of the care is free. On the 50%, you can, the business guys will say, so they make money, they don't, they make an 18% return on, in, on operating margin, which is really good for any hospital. They have a completely tiered system. They actually, this is how the tiers work. It's very structured. And they have actually realized that the only way to manage this is to have consistent quality throughout, throughout and a very consistent way of training. By the way, this care is delivered by very school girls who are only trained for two weeks but are completely supported by clinical decision support systems. Now, I show this as a contrast example of a scale, a scaled model. This is a model I teach very often because it has a lot of illustrative points on how you can solve it correctly when you actually build it correctly. Now, where does is, where is AI-based technology come in? It's very interesting. All this is done by 78 ophthalmologists. You see 2.2 million patients in here with 78 ophthalmologists. Show me one healthcare system in the world that does it. Even Arvind, by the way, the numbers are not this. What he has is a smart EMR developed with Microsoft. It's ophthalmic EMR, and it's really clinical decision trees. You're all he's doing is scaling clinical decision trees to help people make decisions on known evidence. The discussion about if you keep your vocation, it's on known evidence, right? It's not, I don't know how this is going to keep your vocation. We've done clinical decision trees, clinical protocols for years as clinicians. All he's doing it is applying it to scale through computing power and giving it, pushing it forward so that the iPhone, the iPad can use it, okay? But then he does have predictive algorithms, and he's built a neural net-based predictive algorithm mm -hmm. model. And what it does is really interesting. This is what I mean, linking need to technology is very critical. He is the only person that I know in the emerging market that said, I will not accept government data to figure out the prevalence of eye disease. I will do a ground up eye disease study. So he did what's called the Andhra Pradesh eye disease study number one with Johns Hopkins. And he showed that the largest cause of preventable blindness in India, and by the way, in most emerging uh, low middle income countries, is not cataract. It is actually preventable errors of refraction. People have glasses, but they don't know it. And so they feel they can't see. And so they can't see, they don't go to work. And so this is totally preventable. The fact that you have glasses, the numbers outstrip cataracts. In fact, he showed that poorly done cataract surgeries have worse outcomes. So he said, my whole system should actually be able to figure out if a patient, when he comes in, will become or need glasses when he's 10 years or 12 years or 14 or 15 years old, or she. And that is what he built as an AI algorithm because if I can tackle that, I can actually hit a significant issue in public health or eye health. And the only algorithm he's using or the only area of application is this because data is clear, impact is clear, application is clear, and they have significantly moved the blindness needle in India so that their model has now become the national model. And guess what happens? Government of Liberia turns to him and says, manage our entire eye care system. You manage it. We can't manage it. Outsource it to another country. And that itself is an interesting model, by the way. So all the learnings and all the data that's coming in, and I think a lot of people reference Elvi Prasad today, 
fascinating system. And I use it as a case because I think it shows how you can scale correctly. So having said this, I just want to share some frameworks with you that we've begun to start. They're very simple. They're very, very based, grounded in reality. And this is not my work. This is done from the uh, bioinformatics group at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and what Andrew did was he said, if you look at human decision to completely neural network convoluted nets or antagonistic nets, you actually have a spectrum. You have a spectrum that clinicians make decisions to really rule-based, something they're used to. You just soup it up with computing power. And then you go to statistical algorithms, okay, they're used to it, whether it's Bayesian or it's optimization or regression or whatever it is. And then you make you take random trees, okay, more complex, and then you take this, which is really complex. And what yes. he's saying is that as you go up Do here, the, the human interaction yeah. drops and the machine interaction yeah. takes over. That in itself creates yeah. things that need to be solved for. Mm -hmm. But let's not lump these, and I agree with that, and actually that's what we're pushing into this. Because this is needed in the world. This is needed in emerging markets. This needs to be sorted out. Okay? Data dependency also increases. Computing power increases. Data consumption increases. So. We created a simple framework and you can shoot it down. It's a simple matrix. What it says is human control exponentially increases to some people calling it the black box, right? Data needs exponentially increase. The data bias concerns are significant. Is your data representative of where you're going to apply it to? Legal precedence, no, I mean, what is the legal framework under which you're working? The Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law School by the way, had a grant about seven years ago to look at the legal impact of AI. What does it mean when a machine makes a decision? Who is legally responsible? If a machine influences another machine or an AI system with another AI system, where does the medical legal risk lie? The unanswered question. These are important to address, otherwise how are you going to implement it? Okay, <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the security, labeling, I think a significant discussion today was that this big fear, does it augment or does it supplant? All right? And I thought this is key. What are the ethical issues? Who is controlling the data? Whose data? So there's a whole discussion going on. If my data is used and somebody creates billions of dollars, do I get a piece of it? Who is the data ownership? Where is the commercial distribution of gain here? Unanswered. And this is not insignificant. There are huge adoption hurdles. Lower middle income countries, there are massive adoption hurdles, there are massive implementation hurdles. And this becomes much more complicated here. So this is just showing you the green shows. I put green because it's a positive sign, not a negative sign. So actually we actually can think of how to go forward, but unanswered questions, right? And so we've created a framework, very simple, to say, do what you want, but at least look at it in the, in the context of, did it change quality of care? Did it benefit outcomes? Did it improve access of care? Did it upskill? Did it actually create a new workforce that can deliver as good as a professional workforce? What about the economics of care? Is any country ready to take on hundreds or millions of new patients when the health system can barely manage what they have? If you go to any of the public systems in these countries, you'll see they're barely surviving. So what are you going to do to them? If you don't build this out, what are you creating? And then there are cross-cutting issues, and a lot of them have been raised. What is the legal framework? What is the ethics? What are the data-related challenges? What is the validation of the technology? What is the efficacy? There is, I mean, is, have you shown equivocation? And the adoption and implementation challenge. And just to end by saying, we are using this very simple framework which my colleague Megan created. In our own environment, we are actually backing on who's doing AI work in the Harvard environment. There's so many people doing AI work. Who's looking at low and middle income countries? Massive number of people. Who's doing health? That's in our whole healthcare system is doing health. Who's in the middle? We found two guys. Just two people. And I think it's a travesty when two thirds of the global population is sitting there with diseases, the amount of focus is all on OECD, on Western commercialization. I just want to raise the issue, okay? 
because I think that that's a big piece to address. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. That was a very, very interesting presentation and very close to my heart because it's all talks about systems and the need for systems. And it's, it's an important topic because, again, as I mentioned, uh, we don't want to get into a situation where the fantastic solutions out there which are not being used by countries, uh, which are not making the impact, and at the same time the country is saying, where is it going to be? So we, uh, so I should say yes. Okay. So more. Thank you very much for those three very, very fascinating presentations. Uh, mapping out the opportunities and the challenges sure. and the actual uh, the potential to go forward. So I think we saw the submissions this morning and presented a lot of the local centric uh, solutions, but I think this is the need of uh, the, the system state you want. So um, let me not be biased to see if you have any questions up there. There are no questions up there. Okay, so opening up to the, to the group here, but I'll start off with my with my uh, misusing, abusing my right of being the chair, the moderator of the session. The question for you guys. I mean, obviously, there is such big demand for this site, but, uh, but the, the community the developers, the machine learners, uh, the, the AI solution developers, what is the, the incentive or the motivation for these guys? Is it a lack of, of awareness that the systems, of course, has to be there uh, or, or in these areas? Because a lot of the work is seeing is, is focused on the Google Center uh, in, interventions, but not in these areas. So, where is the incentive? Uh, is it a lack of incentive? Is it a lack of awareness? What do you think would be the best approach for these issues of power? Any thoughts? Well, I can tell you our own experience. So for the last six months, we've been actually going from site to site uh, at Harvard, talking to different groups. And there's so many of them. And the most interesting thing is the groups are not aware of what everybody else is doing. And yet every one of the groups wants to look at it from what is the impact of my work. If you start from impact of your work, you have to come to a system solution platform. You have to come to that lens. And everybody wants to work together. But there's no convening body, and that's where HHI comes in, to bring these conversations together and say, what's the commonality? How do you really create change? Obviously, we are a global health institute, so our focus is low and middle income countries, emerging markets, but it does not stop the solution. The lessons are often trans transportable to other environments, it's just bringing them together. Uh, there's interest, there's need, but we just don't know who's doing what. And this, we are one university. Mm -hmm. And okay. I'll add to that, actually, we've been doing similar work within the, the FDA as well by scanning and seeing what's, what's happened, what's been done within the agency and beyond, too. Um, but the, the other point that I would like to mention is actually a point that came out of the recent discussion with the World Economic regarding data standardization, which is what's what's the value of anything we do? And the, the realization that the value differ by different stakeholders as well. Like when you move to Europe, for example, there is a sets of value from the states that are similar in some aspect, but there are differences as well. So understanding the value for different stakeholders and aiming for that and making a, a, an initiative or work that actually connects all the value principles for all the stakeholders involved. We found that to be important. You know, the industry will ask, you know, what's, what's the value for them? You know, the, who own the data sets? You know, patients also have the stakeholders who, like, they, I mean, they're asking who own the data? What's the value added for them? Too? So understanding all of these issues, I think, and bringing the stakeholders together, something similar to what you guys are doing here, but like, even beyond as we move forward, is going to be really critical. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Your microphone? Yeah. This question there. Like, what does that mean? Thank you. Um, for Dr. Mahu, I also come from a developing country, low income country in South America, also working in vision health. So I really, really resonate what you're what you're saying. Um, and we're currently trying to work the Paraguayan government and try to solve the problem that they only have 15 pediatric ophthalmologists for a population of 7 million. So it's very hard to do school screenings and, and, and solve refractive errors, uh, which is very important because, of course, 80% of what we learn is through the visual system. So, um, And one of the problems that we are facing right now is exactly what you described. Um, we, we collect data, we do machine learning, but then 
what do we do with only 15 pediatric ophthalmologists? So I wanted you to explain a little bit more about this system that you have developed and, and the business model of it, because it's really interesting for, for countries like mine. So I think this talks about an area that uh, I didn't hear much of, maybe it's happening, is how do you actually use technology and AI to impact the workforce? And this whole area of upskilling and skill shifting is you really need 15 ophthalmologists to tackle the common errors of refraction and not the, not the surgical issues which is a really small subset. Or can you create a new workforce? And with our medical education system or our professional health education systems are still mired in the past. It goes through a very onerous process of, of educating people. Is there another path and can you do clinical decision support with AI-enabled tools to augment your workforce so that the end product of human and machine is equivocated to long training of humans. And that's the research that needs to be done. Okay? Um, but to me, that's the only way to solve the global professional workforce shortages. Because what you say is physicians, if you go down the hierarchy or naturally across the hierarchy of care de uh, deliverers, you have the same things in text, you have the same things in specialized nursing. In fact, nursing is even a worse problem. You have volume shortages, number shortages, and quality shortages. And as you go to specialized nursing, you can drop. If you look at your uh, in your country, how many nurses are really specialized in ophthalmic OR management or doing eye cases? Very few. And they get lost economically to other countries. So I think it's across the healthcare spectrum and really the creation of the new healthcare worker, which many countries have tried and are doing, but to some different degrees of success. The key among this is quality outcomes. If you're not measuring quality, then you're getting a very disparate level of quality, which means patient harm. I think that's the only way. So AI in education, for professional education in healthcare, is to me equally important as AI in healthcare delivery and needs to be addressed. I have a follow-up question regarding AI, especially in low resource communities or environments as they develop, as develop nations. Um, what do you think the role of AI is in, tra in training uh, healthcare <coughs> providers down the line? Not just MDs per se, but as you, as you allude to, the physician assistants, the RNs, the techs, everybody else along that chain, because especially in these other countries, I think you need a workforce that augments the primary MD because to your point, if you have 15 physicians for I don't know how many million patients you said, that's impossible to screen, diagnose, treat. So what is your thought on that? So I think, and again, this is opening up the education space. I'm not an educationist, but having developed systems, you can't get away from the fact that it's the people who live with the care at the end of the day. So if you look at education, we, we have to really tailor or use data on how you learn and what is necessary learning for a skill set and use the data to optimize information and skill development for individuals so you can create a different workforce. And in the education space, I would say it's even earlier than in the healthcare space of the penetration of data usage, analytics, using AI-based technologies and applying it to how you can change behavior. Because if you don't do that, you really don't work. So one study that was recently done, it just coming out in our system, we are a very big system. We are 6,000 uh, our faculty members in one healthcare system. And they looked at the whole area of the opioid crisis and how do residents treat it versus people who come out of practice for three years versus 10 years and it's very interesting to see it sort of falls their knowledge of treating the opioid crisis of you know confidential misinformation versus confidential real information versus not sure of what they're doing it really depends on how they got trained and how information is fed to them. So I think that whole space of how you learn what information, what's relevant, and how you really use that to apply it is, is where there has to be a lot more work. And we'll go to that. Um, 
maybe taking it a little bit further and saying, you know, like listening to your presentation today, Kamal, I felt that there's a lot of common common issues that we all collectively can address. And I think, for example, the validation of the AI tools. You know, this is I think nobody even in India or anywhere else want to utilize an AI tool that's not valid, that's not proven to help. Going to your point of quality, for example. So I think those are questions that can be addressed across the board, and they can benefit us across borders and internationally. The only final thing I would say is that for the example of clinical trials that we have, you know, in America, the United States in general, it's not homogeneous. So you have the rural areas as well who suffers quite a bit from, for example, the lack of approval for clinical trials. The use of mobile health can be a solution there. So I'm just thinking a little bit outside of the box, outside of the typical sometimes might be helpful. I just have a question. Um, yeah, hi. Thanks, man. Uh, a lot of your great presentations. Uh, so, you know, mainly we focus on the systems aspects of the problem. Um, so, my question is are these systems problems that we're talking about very unique to each country or each? You know, city or each region, or are they? Are they can they be generalized? Because if they can be generalized, you can probably possibly develop a framework that you can use. But it looks to me like they're always unique to each country or each, each region. So if you can just talk a little about that. Yeah, sure. So since I lost all my hair working in over 30 countries, uh, I can tell you my, as I said, experiential perspective. I don't have evidence for this, but. I think in general, my experience is that um, there are, you cut it at two levels. The macro level, a lot of the problems are similar. At the implementation level, they start diverging. Uh, it's when you come down to how do you make change and how do people adopt technology, that's very much dependent on so many factors, including the social budget factors. Uh, but in general, I have found that a lot of these problems. For similar economies that have, um, you know, the growing economies, there's a demand side of that and all that, um, they are, you can take the lessons across. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fabio Garcia, and I work also for the Institute of Global Health and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Virginia. I very much liked your presentation and the fact that you highlighted so much this. this Triangle of AI, health, and, and low and middle income countries. And I would like, to, I mean, I'm fully working into that area as well, particularly with the snake bites and, and other tropical medicine issues. Uh, but I would like to add one more dimension, if, if you agree, which is the, maybe the humanitarian crisis and the health humanitarian crisis. And I work very, very closely with MSF, Dr. Wigan Borders in Geneva and globally. And I think we also need to. In, with a global health perspective, of course, globally and confronted, but we also need to pay attention to, to crisis and humanitarian crisis that involve the health, health component. Yeah, thank you. I just want to endorse that because, for example, pandemic preparedness and epidemic management and sort of prognosticating where the next wave of this epidemic is going, uh, the massive data inputs is being very critical uh, using AI. So, absolutely. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments from the crowd here? Okay, so before closing it, I'm on we've got three minutes, I'm on Blue Sky Dreamer, so I want to ask this man that's going this far. Um, I mean, what do you want to see in the next one year if you would come back here? What is one dream that would ask this community in this group to come up with? And if you don't have, you don't, don't have to. I, I like to pose this question. Um, First of all, I think having this committee and having this team coming together and bringing such a diversity of you know, views and expertise, I think that's really a good start. I, I think we have a long way to go when it comes to AI, just to be frank. I think there are areas we can adopt, and there are areas we need to understand when we can adopt in the future. And I think having a little bit better framework, better understanding across the board of what's, what's that, how would that look like, and then Another aspect is how are we going to not necessarily but evaluate the algorithms, the databases, how are we can have a shared understanding of that. Uh, and you know, for us as a, as a leader, for example, like we want any kind of evidence to keep the same level of standards for, for, for a room drugs, for example. So that's a key element for us. How, how can we absorb or understand or utilize all this evidence but without lowering our standards? 
you know, clinical trials, like as we mentioned, they, they, they're costly, they take a lot of time, but at the same time, they've been the gold standard for us. And how to understand how to utilize AI, maybe to give us something better, you know, this is something we all have to work on in the future. So hopefully a little bit more of an understanding, a little bit more working together across the board. And I think that would be a great step for next year. No, I completely agree. I'll just add that it would be really nice to create some sort of frameworks that are more holistic, that look at all the aspects, um, because I think it will really inform governments and they are going ahead with their own plans as to how to reframe it, because I see that as the biggest concern I have in terms of the train is going off, they're doing stuff, and then you're able to see the backlash in the healthcare space. So that's the only other piece. I think from my perspective, coming from more of a drug development and pharmaceutical perspective, um, I think it would be nice to see some more validation and standardization of some of the tools that were discussed earlier today. For example, um, sorry, I forgot the exact terms, but um, some of the work that's being done, it would be nice to see that further. Just as WHO has standardized dictionaries, it would be nice to see at some point that AI evolves to a point where there are standard dictionaries or standard data definitions so that you, you don't have this wild, wide variability in the playing field and you would have some more standardization and you would have potentially an acceptable range What's it, you know, what, what is it, how do you decide that? Brilliant, thank you so much. Thanks, Nathaniel, for sending such great wisdom and papers.